I'm William Dennis, and thank you for coming to my session on building a nodeless Kubernetes platform. First, a little background about me. I'm a product manager in Google Cloud, where I work on Kubernetes Engine. In 2019, I co-founded GKE Autopilot, and that's what I currently work on. Uh, this is a new mode of operation for GKE, uh, which I'll be talking a bit about today. Uh, I'm a very big supporter of the Kubernetes open source project, and in 2017, I also co-founded the Certified Kubernetes Conformance Program, which is still used today to ensure portability between vendor distributions uh, of Kubernetes. I'm also writing a book published by Manning called Kubernetes for Developers. A little bit about this session. I hope it's going to be useful for all of you um, as you build or build on Kubernetes platforms of your own. In this session, I plan to give you a behind-the-scenes look of the creation of GKE Autopilot, which is a fully managed um, platform for Kubernetes by my team. I'll be giving, uh, throughout the presentation, some arguments for and against uh, the idea of having nodes in a so-called nodeless platform. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the future possibilities that can be enabled by this design. Firstly, let me uh, do a quick audience poll. Um, so I'd like to know, raise your hand, who believes that it's possible to have a nodeless Kubernetes where there is still technically a node object? Show of hands. Got a couple? Not too many. Who doesn't? Everyone else? Yeah. And third option, who believes I was just adding a bit of controversy to my KubeCon talk to you know, spruce up the marketing a bit? <laughs> All right. Um, well, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle of, 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 of those three, um, but let's, let's dig in. So what does, you know, as we look at building a fully managed Kubernetes platform, I think it's worth taking a step back and, and looking at a traditional Kubernetes platform. And I'll be using GKE as the example here. So a traditional Kubernetes platform basically consists uh, of two APIs that you need to interact with as the developer. The first one above is the Kubernetes API. That's what you're here for, right? That's what you're here at KubeCon for. That's what you use Kubernetes for. You want to describe your you know, stateless app in a deployment. You want to maybe represent a, a Redis database or a MariaDB database as a stateful set. You want to create jobs for your workloads, et cetera. That's, that's what you're here for. And then you have this other API uh, under the line, which is the platform API, whether it's GKE or one of the others. And with that API, you have to configure the cluster in order to serve those Kubernetes objects. You might have to create you know, nodes of a certain size or with certain capabilities. I believe that a, a, an ideal fully managed Kubernetes platform would just be the Kubernetes API, where you interact everything at that level using you know, kubectl, using YAML files, basically. Um, so what, is it, what does it mean to build a fully managed Kubernetes platform? Well, when I was looking at this problem in uh, 2018, I wrote a position paper, and I had three headings. Let me just quickly share them here. The first one was that a nodeless or a fully managed Kubernetes platform should still be Kubernetes. Secondly, the containers should be able to utilize um, unused reserved capacity. In other words, allow for bursting. Uh, people come to Kubernetes. One of the reasons they come to Kubernetes is to be able to pull their resources and, and potentially burst uh, when, when needed. And the third thing is I wanted to make sure that we price this in such a way that it supported continual usage. Uh, I, I didn't like the idea of creating like a kind of a, a, a toy version or something that you wouldn't want to run 100, for 100% of your workloads 100% of the time. Um, and on node visibility, I had a suggestion just to make them visible. Um, while still hiding certain bits like maybe the VM. Uh, I'll be digging into that in a bit. So back to that first point, though. The first point being that nodeless Kubernetes or fully managed Kubernetes should still be Kubernetes. Why, why is that important? So when we approach this problem of let's build a, a, a simpler to operate, a simpler to use Kubernetes, a lot of people came to me and said, well, William, Kubernetes is hard. There's, there's a lot you have to learn to get started. There's a lot you need to do just to deploy an app. Maybe at the same time, we should simplify that and create a, a cut down or a simplified experience so you can deploy things more easily. Um, I, th I think that would, would be a mistake. And, and the reason that would be a mistake is that it misses the point of why people were choosing Kubernetes and why Kubernetes is so successful. And I believe the reason is that it's, it's a orchestration layer designed for professionals. Um, these are professionals, like they might be running a, a massive you know, website for a Fortune 500 company, uh, for example. 
And they're a professional, right? They, 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 need, they need power, they need flexibility. You know, one day someone might approach them and say, hey, I need to run a Redis database in this, or I have some like legacy uh, stateful workload that you have to, you have to run. Uh, Kubernetes can handle that. So um, I believe that the, the power behind Kubernetes is, 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 is that flexibility and, and the scalability. So simplicity at the Kubernetes layer was a, was a non-goal. Only simplicity of operating this cluster uh, is the goal. Now, <clears throat> when the team looked at this, we had a couple of different operational models to consider where, uh, when thinking about like, how to actually run pods, how to run uh, pods on this uh, fully managed product. Um, and maybe I'll, t I'll take a pause there and just say that what this product does, basically what our, what our aim was, is that you just create a Kubernetes workload and you don't have to configure nodes, you don't have to manage anything else, we'll provision all the infrastructure for you. So with that in mind, the team looked at a number of different models for actually handling that compute. Um, the first one was actually to use Borg. So I don't know how many people are familiar with Borg. It's, it's a container orchestrator developed by Google and, and used internally, and was the subject of an academic paper which you can find online. Uh, and it actually formed the inspiration for Kubernetes itself many years ago. So one of the options for running your pod containers uh, for us would have been just to run them as uh, so-called tasks or Borg. Um, one of the advantages of that system is that it's, it's uh, massively multi-tenant and uh, we, we would have like very rapid scaling and, and many other benefits. The second option was to reuse more of GKE and run each pod in its own VM. The benefit for that is that by being a lot closer to GKE, it would be more compatible with, with various different infrastructure. Uh, the downside of that approach, though, would be that it would limit the pod sizes that we could offer in this platform to just the range of, of uh, VMs that we have. You wouldn't be able to do something like a you know, 5.25 uh, CPU pod on this system because we don't have a VM of that, of that size. The final option was just be like GKE, the existing product that we were looking at, just be like GKE standard. Um, run, pod, run multiple pods per node, and yeah, basically don't change it too much. <clears throat> the benefit of that when we looked at it was that it would also then support other Kubernetes constructs that actually rely on nodes, such as daemon sets, um, uh, pod affinity, node affinity, things like that. So in the end, the team chose to make it just like GKE. Um, one of the other nice things about this is that we can offer, a, a, we, we were able to offer like a wide range of pod sizes, scaling from a quarter of a core all the way to 28 cores in quarter core increments. So we'd be able to support something like a 17.75, you know, vCPU pod without having to scale it up to one, to a predetermined size. It also provides for maximum compatibility. So that was kind of uh, one of the first uh, foundational decisions we made on the, on the path of building this uh, product. The next question was uh, around visibility. If we're trying to create a fully managed Kubernetes platform, one that's so-called nodeless, like, what does it mean when you go kubectl get nodes? Uh, should it list all the nodes that we actually have there? Should we you know, just group that together in one and just return you know, autopilot node and just sort of hide all that detail? Um, in the end, we went with just list the nodes, be transparent, show the user what, what's actually happening under the hood, even if they most of the time don't have to care about it. Second, second decision we looked at was, what about the actual like, inner workings of those nodes? Should we be transparent about what, what shape those nodes are? Should we tell you if it's like an Intel or an AMD or uh, this, this type of machine or that type of machine? Should we disclose you know, how much of the allocatable table is, is, has been used? Um, this was actually the subject of a lot of debate in the team. Uh, some people were like, no, we should hide it, right? Because you shouldn't have to care about this, so why, why should you know about it? Um, but in the end, we actually went with full transparency. The reason is that we want you to be able, we, we want you to trust us that we're gonna do the right thing with your pods when you schedule them in, in this platform, but we're gonna let you verify what we did as well. So if you wanna poke under the covers and, and see exactly how things landed, it's all there, fully transparent. I don't think we hired, uh, we, we literally don't hide a single field compared to um, the GKE standard product. The other question was, can users access the VM object separately outside of Kubernetes? Um, 
So at this point, it's probably worth mentioning, actually, I showed a diagram before that developers use two APIs to interact with this system. It turns out there's actually a third one right at the bottom, right, which is uh, the VM API. Um, the reason I didn't show that before is typically uh, people using Kubernetes don't have to care about the VM API. It's 100% managed for you. But it happens to be there, and you can interact with it. Like, for example, you can SSH into a node. So going back, one of the, one of the problems we had there was, um, you know, should we allow access to that object? Uh, decision was no. In, in this case, we will completely eliminate that API since uh, it's not necessary at all for the, for the developer. <clears throat> so those were some of the key design decisions going into this. Um, now I'm going to cover a little bit about how we actually implemented this. OK. <clears throat> so we built this product using, um, using various components that already existed in GKE. The way GKE works um, and, and the platform that we were dealing with is that uh, nodes of the same configuration are grouped into a, a semantic grouping called a node pool. Uh, so for example, up on screen there, I have a node pool with eight uh, v vCPU cores and uh, 16 gigabytes memory, and there's another one with four and four. Um, and so what happens is if there's existing space on one of those nodes, the pod will just get placed. But what about when there isn't? OK, so let's say we have uh, two pending pods here, one that can fit on one of these existing uh, no, um, node pools and one that can't. So for the ones that can fit, there's a component called the cluster autoscaler, which will actually look at existing node pools and extend that node pool to, include, to add an extra node that can, that can handle that pod, and therefore that pod will be scheduled. In the case of the pod that didn't fit in any of the existing uh, node pool definitions, we, have a, we used a separate component that exists in, in GKE called the node auto provisioner. And that component is capable of creating a new node pool definition, in this case one larger with 16 CPU, 32 gigabytes of memory, in order for that pod to fit. Um, but the final step is actually that cluster autoscaler is then responsible for actually creating a node in that node pool to run that pod. So under the hood, that is what is happening. That is how we built it. And how this system works and, and, and how it actually actuates on the, on the user input is because we've pretty much eliminated the actual like node API and the node pool API, so there's no way for users to specify those things, we derive everything from the pod spec. So one of the simple examples is the, uh, the resources needed, so things like the CPU and the memory, we, we derive that from the resource requests of the pod. Um, Another example would be node features. And this is an interesting one. In the past, if you wanted to have a bunch of nodes with different features, like for example, you wanted to use spot compute, you would typically go ahead and create a node pool that was a spot node pool. And then you would target that spot node pool with your pods. Um, with autopilot, we flip the script there, and you actually specify the requirement just in the pod spec. And we will actuate on that and provision a node that can then handle that pod spec. Which I think is actually a really nice design because it means that all of the configuration of the hardware essentially, right, of like hardware properties like this should be a spot node, um, and in the future potentially other things like, you know, this pod needs a GPU, all this is done at a pod level, at a workload level, right where all the rest of your configuration is. You don't have to kind of do this multi-pass where you design your pods and you, and you write those specs and then you have to go and figure out the nodes that can run them. There are a couple of other additional components that we used. I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, we use a component called re release channels to keep them updated and node order repair to, keep, to uh, replace unhealthy nodes. OK, so that's how we provision the resources to manage the pods. Um, another aspect of the implementation of this platform was an admission uh, webhook. So, we had to achieve two things here. One is that I mentioned that we, have a, we built the system to have a very wide range of resources for the pods, but there were still some uh, limits. Uh, you need to, the, the pod CPU needs to be between uh, a quarter of a core and 28 cores, and there's a ratio of CPU to memory. So what we do is we use a um, mutating webhook to look at the pod requests to ensure everything is within the range. And if it's outside of the acceptable value, we will actually just mutate the pod and fix it for you. 
When we do that, we emit a warning if, if you're using kubectl, and we also write an annotation into the pod spec that basically logs what we changed um, so that you can kind of audit that. The second part is we have a validating admission controller, and the validating admission controller is designed to enforce policies that prevent users from running um, admin level workloads on the nodes. Now, why is that needed? <clears throat> The reason we need to restrict admin level workloads, like basically preventing root access, is that we want to offer a fully managed platform where Google SRE team are basically responsible for running these nodes. And what that means is we can't really offer you, the users, uh, direct access to those nodes at, an, at, a, at a root level, because then people can potentially uh, go in, modify the kernel, change bits and pieces, uh, and, and, and we essentially just lose the confidence to actually manage that thing for you because we don't know what's happened to the node. So it's important for us that all the nodes kind of look the same or at least you know, have, have very well-known properties. So we have a, an admission controller there to enforce those policies. What did we pick uh, as our list of enforced policies? This is the list. Um, some of the simple ones are, and I already kind of mentioned, was limiting privileged pods. So this is a pod with the security context of uh, privilege equals true. Um, this basically gives you, you know, almost like root access on the node. So we, we reject that. Um, we also reject some Linux capabilities like sysadmin. Interestingly, though, many uh, Linux capabilities are actually still offered in this product. So uh, ptrace was actually requested by one of our security partners. They wanted to be able to use ptrace to inspect uh, running, running processes. We looked at that. We, we felt like uh, it was actually quite fine to offer. So we, we added that in, into the list that you can actually use. Um, other things we clamp down on uh, are stuff that like, directly relates to the node. So you know, the goal here is to build a nodeless product. So we don't really want people using host port and you know, running a container, say, on port 80 on the host, because then if you try and schedule another container also with port 80, we can't co-locate that on the same node. It kind of breaks our bin packing model and uh, imp impacts the platform. So we ha had to limit that. Limited host networking, uh, which is also fairly, fairly highly privileged. Uh, host path, we're, we've also restricted, although you can, have, uh, you can mount var logs in, in read-only mode, which means that you can actually, as a user, just have like a, a, a daemon set, like scraping logs. That's totally fine. Um, as far as node affinity keys are concerned, we, uh, we restrict host name because, again, we don't want users thinking about nodes. We don't want people targeting specific nodes. Um, but we allow many other node affinity keys like the zonal topology or regional topology, things like that. Um, one thing we didn't restrict was the ability to run a container um, as the root user. You can yourself restrict that using the, the open source pod security admission. Um, we, we didn't actually need to restrict that because the, uh, the security boundary of this product is still the VM. It's not actually a multi-tenant uh, system at all. The VMs are still 100% your VMs, uh, your nodes. Uh, so we didn't feel the need to actually restrict this. And if, if we did restrict this from a usability perspective, like half of all Docker images wouldn't run, so that'd be a problem too. <clears throat> so. So far, as I've been talking about this implementation, one of the interesting things are, is you could have actually done every single thing I've described yourself. You can use the cluster autoscaler. You can use the node auto provisioner component. You can write your own uh, mutating webhook, admission controller. You can do all that. You can literally build exactly what I just described yourselves today on you know, GKE standard. So if that's the case, like, why do we even need this other product? <laughs> um, aside from the fact that it's a bit challenging uh, creating these mutating webhooks and so on. Well. Obviously, one of the benefits of us doing it is that it's all pre-configured in a nice package, but that alone is probably not enough. There's a couple of things that we add with this product that is sort of hard to do yourselves, and, and that is uh, the billing model is different. It's, it's uh, request-based, so we, we charge based on the pod request rather than the, the nodes. Um, obviously, that's not something that you can change as a user. Um, probably the biggest selling point is that by creating a fully managed platform with nodes in a, in a known condition, for the first time, we were actually able to add a node SRE onto this product. So how the traditional uh, GKE Kubernetes platform worked is the nodes were, were kind of a shared responsibility model. Uh, Google would take a lot of responsibility for it, but the users would also be responsible. And, and that was because people could go in with root access and change them. And it was sort of hard for us to know what had changed. So with this product, since, that we've, since we've um, eliminated that, we can actually, for the first time, offer SRE. Essentially, that's kind of the, the bargain that you have when you use this product. If you're willing to give up that little bit of control about not being able to modify the node, um, which I think, for, hopefully for most workloads, is totally fine to give up. You don't, you know, if you're running MariaDB, you shouldn't, shouldn't have root access. 
Um, what you get in return is a more fully managed system with, with um, us being the SRE. Uh, the other thing is that we, as I mentioned, we eliminated completely the, the VM API. So there, there, are, there is no visibility on these VMs. The VMs are actually still there. They're, they're exactly the same. They have a different prefix. Um, so if you, if you look at, if you look at the, the kubectl get node output, you might notice that the autopilot node uh, has the prefix gk3 instead of gke. Um, the, node, the, the virtual machines are actually still there, the, the, still there in the product, but the, the API is removed. Um, this has the benefit uh, for users that, uh, particularly uh, security conscious ones, they don't have to worry about things like SSH because there is no SSH into these nodes, so it's like more locked down. That's another advantage of the product. Okay, so I covered the design and the implementation of, of how we built it. Let's look a little bit now at the, the result. Um, where did we land? What, what does this look like? So <clears throat> at the beginning, I showed this diagram of uh, the, the two APIs essentially users ha have to interact with in order to get Kubernetes, in order to use Kubernetes. And even this diagram with that extra uh, VM um, API at the bottom, which you typically don't have to use, but it's there, and you, you might have to care that it's there. So with, with Autopilot, what we were able to achieve is we essentially shrank the entire GKE API surface area down to one command, which is create. You just create it, you connect it to kubectl. From that point on, you are 100% just inter interacting using the Kubernetes API. So it's really a kind of a, I like to think of it as like a very pure you know, Kubernetes platform. The API you're using on this platform is just the Kubernetes API. There's, there's no node pool API. You don't have to configure scaling, auto scaling, anything like that. You just interact with it through Kubernetes. Uh, from a UI standpoint, uh, we, you know, obviously the UI representation of that, of that API is also pretty nice. There's just three fields, and you can create a, basically a production grade cluster, and one of those fields is, a, is an arbitrary name. OK. <clears throat> now now for, the, for the meat of this talk, I guess. Um, what are the benefits realized from all this, from this design of you know, building this fully managed platform, which actually looks a lot like the traditional GKE, right? It has, it has you know, pretty much the same nodes under the hood, the same multiple pods per node, a lot, a lot of the same things. Um, other than the fact that that you know, potentially made it a little bit faster for us to build, like what's the benefit to the user? What's the benefit of this design? Um, and, and I hope this is relevant to all of you, particularly if you're also building your own Kubernetes platforms. Maybe, maybe this might be of interest as well. Uh, I think the first benefit is that it enables really granular pod sizes. Because we're bin packing pods onto machines, we don't have to shoehorn the pods into VM sizes. So uh, I, I did cover that earlier, but you, know, you can basically create like a you know, 21.25 core pod and, and, and just slot it in there. We'll, we'll run that just fine. And then you, know, you can add a quarter of a core, another one core, whatever, whatever you want to do. It's, it's uh, very, very flexible. And I think that kind of matches what users want. Um, other nice things about keeping the, the node object as a, or the, or the kind of the node scheduling concept in this design is that things like pod affinity and anti affinity continue to work. These are important concepts that come from the Kubernetes API, right? And if you remember back to my um, original proposal, I really wanted this to look like and, and be a, a fully capable Kubernetes platform. Well, it's not fully capable if you eliminate things like pod affinity and affinity. Uh, pod affinity might be used, for example, if you have like a front end pod and a back end pod, and you want to say, I want these pods to always be together on the node. Well, it's hard to do that if you don't have nodes. In, in a fully nodeless system, you can't do that. Um, this actually works quite fine with our design. We, we will ensure that that constraint is satisfied. Um, similar story with node affinity. Uh, so we, we, you know, we offer zonal affinity. So if you have a zonal resource and you want your pods in that same zone, you can use that. Uh, one, one slight, I guess, drawback of this system is occasionally you might want to separate workloads in, in a one pod per node system. You don't have to separate them because they're always separated. Um, but for that, you can actually just use the Kubernetes constructs of tolerations and node selection. So again, the Kubernetes API already has the, you know, the, the language, the syntax to describe these things, and, and we can honor that in this uh, managed product uh, that still has nodes. Pod spread topologies work. And the last one here is daemon sets. Daemon sets is often, um, often overlooked, I think, when it, when it comes to fully managed platforms. But they're actually really important. 
Daemon sets don't make much sense if you only have one pod per node, um, because the whole point is you want to run an agent on the node. The good thing is, with this, with this proposal, with this design, you can still have a daemon set, because there are still nodes, with one catch. And the catch is that daemon sets are typically used to actually modify the node. So how does, that, how does that work in this system? We have, on one hand, it, it has nodes, so you can you know, theoretically have a daemon set. But on the other hand, we limited uh, some of the administrative functionality, which means some of the use cases of that daemon set no longer apply. Um, the compromise we reached here is that we looked at uh, well-known products and solutions uh, out there in the community, out there you know, commercially available. And we decided to uh, allow list specific solutions so they could continue to work on autopilot. So many uh, security, logging, and monitoring solutions that are commercially available, like all the people you see out there on the, on the booth floor, um, most of those solutions still work. And if they don't work, they can probably come and chat to me and we can make it work. Um, the reason we could do that is, as I said earlier, the security boundary for this product remains the VM. So even though by allow listing certain partner workloads to have elevated privileges, uh, the security boundary remains the same. It's still the VM. This is not a multi-tenant product, so we didn't have that concern. The main concern when we were building this from, from like a design perspective was we had to make sure those nodes are supportable. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't just want to like open the floodgates and let all kind of node modifications happen. But if it's a known set um, and you know, professionally supported software, we felt like that was safe enough to offer from a supportability point of view. So it still allows daemon sets. And I think that's important because you know, if you have a workload that you're running on-prem or you're running you know, on, on, on another cloud provider or, or on GKE standard and you want to migrate it around, you probably have, uh, in fact, most of our customers have at least one you know, daemon set workload they just want to run. If we didn't offer this, essentially you would have to go in and add that, whether it's security or logging or whatever, you would have to add that functionality to every single pod, which I think is a really, really big burden on developers. So, that is actually one of the really overlooked benefits, um, I, I think, of, of still supporting nodes and still offering a multi-pod multi per node system. Other benefits, and, and this mostly kind of helps us as we you know, work on the product further, but um, other benefits of this design are the fact that the infrastructure features, uh, it's very similar to GKE, so a lot of things just work. Um, one really good example is stateful set. So right out of the gate, on, on day one, we were able to support persistent volume claims using block storage resources, which means you can run MariaDB, Redis, any other stateful workload just works because it's the same infrastructure. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, when we look at adding additional features, things like you know, new machine types, maybe uh, if, if, you're, if, you, if you follow the, the Google Cloud naming pattern, you know, like N2 or C2, things like the, the highly optimized compute machines, Stuff like that is actually going to be a lot easier for us to add because we chose this model and because um, it's basically sharing that same infrastructure. Hardware like GPU, local SSD, again, because these are just regular VMs under the hood, uh, it's, it's a lot simpler for the team to add support for those features. Um, and finally, it's possible to offer burstable class pods. So I mentioned this right at the very beginning as, as one of my three kind of objectives, and that was the ability to utilize um, unused capacity in the cluster bipods. Why do I think this is important? The reason I think this is important is that if you have like three or four pods all running on a node, it's likely that at some point, some of them are completely idle. Let's say it's a web serving application. You may have you know, three pods that are completely idle. Now, if a request comes in to one of those pods, you ideally don't want to constrain it to just the resources that that pod requested. Now, certainly that pod needs to be able to handle that request within whatever SLO you have, with the resources it requested. But wouldn't it be nice if opportunistically it could just burst, use the capacity you're already paying for on the node, um, and serve that request a little bit faster, delight the user a little bit more? I feel like that's, that's a really important feature. And it is possible with this design. It's really only possible with this design, because you, if you don't have multiple pods on the node, if you don't have this concept of the node, then you can't really pull that capacity for bursting. We don't actually offer this yet in, in the product that we built, um, but it's something that we're looking at. And I'd like to share a, a quick kind of design of how this might work. So if you look at uh, guaranteed class pods today, the CPU requests equal the limits, uh, which means there's no bursting. Traditionally in Kubernetes, you could, you could set a, a much higher limit than the request and thus create a, a burstable pod that, that can scale up when there's extra resources. 
The problem with the design that we came up with is take this example of three pods that totally have requested five and a half cores and that are running on an eight core machine. The problem is, in a traditional Kubernetes model, those pods would be able to use up to eight cores, which could be a bit of a problem for us. It might allow for some gaming of the system where you could sort of try and convince Autopilot to create like an eight core node, run a, run a one core workload on it, you know, try and prevent other pods getting on there in, with, you know, using some technique, um, which is potentially possible, and thus kind of you know, get like 8x your resources. That would be a problem for us. So, so the ideal design would be, well, what if the user could burst within the paid for capacity on the node at any given time? So if we clamp the bursting, in this case, to five and a half cores, then we would be giving you, you know, the capacity that you're paying for, which would be ideal. Only problem is it turns out that's a bit hard to do with the way uh, Linux, uh, the completely fair scheduler works in Linux today. It's a little bit hard to do that. Uh, so one idea we have uh, that we're actively looking at is to potentially um, kind of round up to the nearest integer number of cores by just turning off the, the unused cores and allowing full bursting within, um, in this case, six cores. That's just an idea we have. Um, stay tuned for that. What about the downsides? I did, I did mention that there would be pros and cons. Uh, a couple of the downsides, uh, I believe, of, of the design that we came up with here is that there is a potential for allocatable inefficiency in this system. Right? It's possible if the user is creating and deleting a lot of pods of all different shapes and sizes that you could end up with uh, very much underutilized nodes. And that requires uh, you know, the team to build additional features like defrag to kind of correct that. Uh, so that's a bit of extra work that we, that, that we, that we end up uh, taking. Um, it doesn't affect the user. The user doesn't care about that, really. Uh, it's kind of more just a problem for the infrastructure platform um, to solve. Yeah, the other potential issue, obviously, by you know, running two containers, two pods on, on the one node, you can potentially have resource contention. Um, although we do have a way to solve that for, for users, they can still separate the workloads when needed. Um, and a couple of downsides of using a multi-single tenant platform, like we do, as opposed to a, a fully multi-tenant platform, is that it's harder for us to add hot standby capacity. So one of the really nice benefits of a, of a multi-tenant system is you typically have you know, a massive resource pool shared by everyone. You can just you know, individuals can scale up and down very quickly. We don't have that ability uh, with, with this design, so that is one, that is one drawback. Uh, adding a new pod, uh, if it needs a new node, can take between 60 and 80 seconds. And there's a little bit of greater operational complexity on the platform side, I think, if any time you operate a multi-single tenant system, there's a little bit of extra ops complexity, but again, most of these downsides, by the way, are kind of just a burden on us. I, I think, uh, n you know, just makes a couple of different problems a little bit harder to solve, but hopefully it's solvable. Okay, so in summary, um, and you know, this is the, the, the takeaway here, I guess, that I'd like to try and convince you, I uh, hope I did convince you of this. Is this nodeless and does that even matter? Um, well, you know, when, when I started this project back in 2018, Nodeless was kind of synonymous with fully managed Kubernetes. And I guess maybe the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not a good synonym. Um, I maintain that this design is, is operationally nodeless. It's nodeless in the sense that you don't care about the nodes, you don't have to think about them. Um, but, there's, but I do believe there is a benefit, as I've hopefully outlined, of having nodes existing as a scheduling concept uh, when needed and when relevant. So that was our journey. I hope that was useful. I hope. I hope uh, yeah, I hope it's of interest to, to learn how uh, the team went about and built this thing. Uh, maybe, maybe it can inspire you as you're building your own products and services with Kubernetes. Um, and with that, I'd love to take any questions. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, also happy to continue the debate on Twitter, over a beer, or, or however you want to do it. Um, there are a couple of microphones if anyone has a question, and uh, I think it might be a roaming mic as well. Thank you. Uh, can we have the mic uh, go live, please? Yep. I think Testing. So. Okay. Lovely. Hi. I'm the moderator. I'll be doing questions online if there are any, but there aren't any at this point. But just wanted to let you know that we have about a minute till our schedule okay. in time, but we'll do a couple of questions. We can go just a few minutes over. Okay. Sounds great. Got it. Please. Take it away. Um, well, I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, well, the company we work, I work with is subject to a lot of audits, and they require us to split nodes in different subnets. 
in order to you know segregate them on a network level. And also, they require us to install certain software and binaries on these nodes. Basically, we have to be in control of the machine image that we use to spin up the nodes. And I wanted to ask if this is capable, if you are capable of doing this. Yeah, I'm not, I'm just Both of these things, actually. Uh, I, I don't know if the subnet uh, separation thing is possible. That's something I'd have to probably take offline and, and do a deep dive with you. With the, with the security components that you're running, I, I would like to think that it is possible. We do work with a lot of security partners to make sure that their solutions work. Mm -hmm. So unless it's like a homegrown, home-built container, uh, I would say the answer is probably yes, it either works or can be made to work with this system. Um, uh, the, the other thing, by the way, is as you go to these auditors, hopefully you can uh, position this Oh, and we would help you, right, position this as a more secure uh, platform to begin with, right, because things like SSH are completely eliminated from the nodes as well. So. Yeah, um, I don't know about that because they were pretty reluctant of allowing us to go to the cloud in the first place. Right. So <laughs> I'm not really sure how, you know, cool they will be with that. But yeah, uh, then the other question that spikes up is, um, is uh, our RDAV, for example, softwares, um, you know, enabled through daemon sets, mm -hmm. or is that the way you do it? We, we, which software, sorry? Um, for example, antivirus softwares. Right, yes, yes, you would install that, you would install that with a daemon set. All right. Um, pr provided, like, if the daemon set is using privilege, which it probably is as a virus scanner, yeah. um, it, would, it would need to be specifically allow listed by my team, but we have, we've already done about, uh, I think, about eight or nine solutions, uh, and, and there's room to grow that, so yes, it would be through a daemon set. All right, thank you. And apart uh, all the good things of benefits of the GKI Autopilot, we are active users of uh, happy users of the GKI Autopilot. But and the restrictions we come up with the with not being able to deploy things like secret store and th these kind of drivers. Do you have any plan to overcome those issues that implicitly this kind of uh, designs imposes? Because yeah, we want to use uh, Bolt, for example, for secrets, and we weren't able to do that by using standard CSI drivers instead of uh, creating direct connections to those Bolt clusters and so on. Okay, uh, I believe Vault might actually work now because uh, I, I know I've tested it and I think I got it working. Unless you're using a different configuration to yeah, what I was using. The, your own, let's say, the Google Cloud Platform GitHub repository has one secret stud and there is a limitation of host path and privilege to, to okay. uh, actively being used. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think like when, when, it come, when it comes to these like restrictions, basically we have to, we have to either if it's a kind of a partner, like a well-known container, a well-known workload, we can, we, can tech, we can potentially allow list it. The, the other option we have is if it's like a technique we have to enable, we essentially have to kind of productize it. So if you need a driver, it might be the case where we just have to offer the driver as a feature, right? Where you can just okay. turn on that driver. So um, we, 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 should, we should connect and continue this conversation, but, but I, I do believe Vault should actually work. I know when, when we first launched the product, we didn't offer mutating webhook support, which broke like half of the, you know, the kind of types of workloads like Vault and things like that, which need to mutate workloads. We did add that in recently, uh, so that was a restriction that we never really designed to be in the product. It was kind of like collateral damage. Okay. So we fixed that. So, yeah, I do believe that Vault should actually work in particular, but yeah. we should follow. We drop you a direct. Please, uh, please. please. And, uh, All right. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Last question. I think then we might have to wrap. Yeah. Hi. A uh, quick one. Uh, yeah. I saw a couple of times the restriction on CPU increment being 0 0.25. Is that on purpose? And if so, why? Good question. Um, it's, it's, it's a decision I think we should actually revisit. Uh, the, you know, the plan was to start a little bit conservative, I guess, because it's much easier to, to relax these restrictions over time. And, and I, I, I believe that the, the theory was, uh, and, and like I was part of the decision, and I'm still trying to remember kind of like, like why did we actually do that? I think it was just so that when we pack the pods on the, on, on the nodes that are kind of, if, if they're known kind of sizes, like, you know, the little Tetris kind of diagram, you know, we can kind of slot it in a little bit better. In, in hindsight, I, I'm not convinced it's actually needed, to be honest. So, um, yeah, we might, we might take another look at that. And, yeah, I mean, w would you like to just have, like, just anything? <laughs> like, between, we, we probably need a minimum, but, uh, yeah. All right, that was a thumbs up for the, for, the, for the people online. Great. Well, great questions. Thanks a lot. Like I said, let's keep the conversation going, too. Thank you.